parts of the conversation with Afrofuturism because when we were talking yesterday, just briefly about it, you know, I know it's it's um kind of becoming a term people are overusing without the right content context and content to me. However, uh, this is like the real deal. So I'd like to just let inform people this is one segment, but that they should follow the future segments of the other folks you're going to have coming on in the coming weeks, um, because we, we, we're we kind of hitting that uh, frequency right now between what Abe mentioned about the future of, of the world in 2050 plus. Um, we're just watching what's going on around the world. You know, we're watching what's happening in Brazil, watching what's happening here. Uh, you know, this whole election process and, and, and the rise in fascism. And um, my used to always say, you know, when in, imminent change always creates extreme violence. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's how things are really changing is because, you yeah. know, you've experienced everything from the burning down of the Library of Alexandria to to um, to the Black Wall Streets and all of these kinds of things. Yeah, and uh, that's a great point. And I think that also because of the planetary reality, um, there's a the compounding effect of that, 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 you know, that is also the, the awakening and the higher consciousness that's happening as a result of all this. And it's gonna hit, it's hitting already, um, but with our planetary reality and the climate and all of these things, uh, the shift is gonna be massive and it's gonna be real. And it's impending. Um, so all of these conversations are so important because people need to reconnect with, there's a, there's a, a level of remembrance that that's actually what's gonna lead us to our survival um, as we move forward, as who knows what's gonna happen, um, you know, whether things get worse or whatever in terms of climate, but it's about remembrance and it's about tapping into that ancestral component. Um, that's, that's the way forward. So yes, my mom, by far the most influential in pushing me to follow my dreams, uh, and and do the research and you know as long as she, you know she would always she used this she would use one slang and that was you know make sure your nose is not open it's a blues slang when you, your nose is open means too many things come into you into your mind and you get sidetracked whether it was a, a music or something and she would say you know don't just make sure your nose is not too far open and that that was the only only advice she gave me and it was beautiful advice it's important for me to have those conversations with youth. I love going into the schools, especially music programs. It's easier for me to make that connection, obviously, and play and discuss the things that connect them to the continent, because we're all connected to the continent. We're all connected to Africa, period. That's, that's just scientific and spiritual fact beyond belief. So, what I do is just to connect them, to, to be comfortable with it, because colonialism and other things have have gotten even Black people afraid to make that statement, afraid to assimilate to those facts, afraid to do some of the things like dis discover your food and your language and understand all of these brilliant things. Um, I, I told these young uh, girls, I went to speak at a, a junior high school, and a couple of the girls had braids. And I mentioned to them, do you know, that concept of braiding your hair was also used for you to for routes for young ladies to escape if they were going to be, you know, if they would be hunted down by colonialists, by Europeans coming to the continent or ways to get back to where you actually are from. There's all of these things where hair wasn't just a style. There's so many things connected and it made them their faces kind of they became really elated, like, wow, I didn't know. So that's the part, the educational piece, because education is a really important part of of moving, of you moving, the difference between you moving forward and not getting stuck, getting lost, and being able to navigate. That's my N word. My N word is navigate. And navigating is an important part of life for you because I've been places where I make people uncomfortable and I've been places where people made me uncomfortable. So I have a choice. I can either sit down and try to tell someone who doesn't want to hear the history of Africa, you know, at a pub, 
or at a concert or in line at the museum or I can navigate myself in the in the way that how is this going to be effective? How am I going to make this conversation very effective? I've got thrown out of many classrooms growing up and even many programs in many schools and also thrown off of many uh, quote unquote um, uh, they have these kind of jazz conferences and we're going to have these round tables because the conversation always deals with just America or Europe or a period of time. And you cannot discuss humanity, art, and food or any topic without it having a history. So it's important for me to make that connection via simple conversation, performances, and getting especially young people to under, not to be afraid of things and be patient with them. Let them know if you like house, if you like hip hop, if you like grunge, if you like metal, all of those things have a connection to the continent. And if you bring that into the conversation, some of the walls begin to come down. So uh, what do we take to the generations that are growing up, you know, uh, education being one thing, but we're saying like, listen, for the future, when you know the so-called dark continent was never really that, you know, it was just the blight that was imposed on it. But what do we tell them about the future? You know, from a, from a music standpoint and cultural activism in a way, it's a tough question. Well, you tell them the truth and you let them know that there's no such concept as leapfrogging. It's all really connected. So if you want to learn about what's going to happen, you have to learn about where things came from before. And if you study any, even hip hop, even for me growing up here and, 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 and having uh, uh, the, the, the concept of politically, and I'll keep it brief, the 80s, late 70s coming in, America assuming the government wise, it has a lot of money. So everyone's kind of celebrating this concept, yet politically programs, I watch them happen. I'm the youngest of three. My brother and sister went to high school the instruments were included in your, your regular daily program. Everybody walked home with a saxophone or a guitar or a trombone, whether you want to be a, a musician or not. The importance of music was the same importance as science and mathematics and physical education and so on. By the time my generation came around, those programs were closed. So I look at hip hop as this brilliant concept because they, fortunately, I grew up in a house where I took piano lessons and I played with jazz cats and I had older musicians in my neighborhood, but a lot of my colleagues didn't. So this concept of scratching and making music and taking Caribbean parties and converting them into one turntable with a coin on top that you scratched, you, you taped it so the needle wouldn't move to two turntables to this incredible art form that had impact on the whole world shows another sign of genius like the pyramids. I'm not comparing hip hop to the pyramids. I'm comparing your mindset into you putting yourself in a position where you can create and be yourself and express, etc. That's what I mean. So we don't get the concepts mixed up. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, on that that happened out of necessity. How else can we be created? I know for a fact if other cultures came up with graffiti, it would be all over every museum in the world right now. But because it came out of the hood or it was looked a certain kind of a way, but a lot of the stuff is it's completely stunning. Certainly, I'm not into tagging people's homes or their businesses. Yeah, you, you know, there's a there's a there's a, um, a, a kind of an academic side or, or the law abiding side to it. But it is an incredible art form. I just went to see the Basquiat exhibition, which I highly recommend everyone go to see because I was here in New York when hip hop and punk and graffiti and even the great Basquiat were starting to merge. It's an incredible time in New York that was starting to happen, like it was like a renaissance. But uh, getting back to, to your question with the youth, it's get, telling them the truth and getting them the information because I'm certain anyone watching this, if you know what your grandmothers, your grandparents did or great grandparents did, it certainly affects the decisions you're gonna make in the future. When I speak to also very young youth, I use the apple pie or the blueberry pie or whatever. So I ask, what is, what's the favorite thing your grandmother makes? Whatever it is, uh, uh, cannolis, whatever it is. If you watch your grandmother make that rice or those beans or that chicken or that pie or whatever it is or that pizza, and you saw what she put into it and it tasted amazing, mm -hmm. even you knew you were on the level of your grandma. But that's something that you learn. Like, oh, she really has the concept. And my mother's still sharpening her knife on the concept. So I have to begin now. 
because your goal is to get it to taste as good as your grandmother's. So that means you're taking that information with you and you have offspring. You want to pass that down and say what that importance is. It's the same with music, education, language, and all of those things. So items to have around. I also tell young people, keep a picture of your grandmother in your book bag or at your computer or in your room to get the spiritual connection there. You know, uh, or maybe she has a piece of jewelry or your granddad had his favorite sweater or whatever. Wear it, put it on. Or wear your grandfather's slippers. Or whatever it is, just keep that kind of, in my opinion, spiritual connection. That helps as a reminder. The educational piece is important, but you also, with all the distractions now, we have TikTok and this and this and this and that. We need academic reminders. As the Buddhists say, actual proof. Mm -hmm. That's something that you can say, wow. And I think that also helps facilitate the educational piece into becoming more valuable. You're focusing on what you picked up before the age of five, walking in the campo in DR and avocados falling off, the papayas hitting you on the head, the mangoes are like, you don't watch, they'll hit you on the head, you know, doing all of those, having all those wonderful experiences. And you're now coming in with all these beautiful menus. You know, I have your book uh, that, that, you know, you so graciously gifted me, um, which talks about recipes for a community that may have forgotten the connection with the land because of income levels and food deserts, as you often talk about. So maybe you can shed a little bit light, a little bit of light on the food deserts, what you're doing with your food activism, and where do you think is the future? Because the the Rastas, when I hung out with them, they taught me a whole lot of concepts which connect very deeply with my culture you know in terms of you know being very very grateful to mother earth uh, etc and i'm just wondering where you are with that conversation with your activism yeah um wow that's a yeah it's a powerful uh question um that involves a lot uh, and certainly i'm not the the first person or the the only person that's working on these ideas or these issues and i stand on the shoulders of generations specifically here in the bronx that have been engaging and fighting and voicing um to see changes and to just clamoring really um for a shift um specifically here i would say in the bronx it's just you know, there's a history of disinvestment. Um, and that history is a, has a compounding effect. Um, that disinvestment, it, you know, goes hand in hand with these ideas of uh, or the realities of redlining. And so you have a space um, within New York City that um, has the experience of very specific and very um, real um i would say uh specific and real trauma when it comes to um access and so my work really has been around connecting dots here and connecting dots specifically because you know when you are in in a state where you are uh forced to be in survival mode you're not thinking about certain things and you're certainly not connecting certain dots because you're almost in a loop and so this loop allows for us not to transcend in many ways and the way that i think uh afrofuturism sort of is embedded in all that we do is because I think that the way forward is now and the future is now and the future and the now should look like what we want to see. And that's how we make it happen. Um, and specifically at Reborn Farms, it is building decentralized systems. And why decentralized systems? Because you, in order to have sovereignty and for you to re-engage with your power uh, in the community and within yourself, you have to, in many ways, decouple yourself from that which upholds 
your poverty, that which upholds your trauma, etc. And doing that with food is incredibly powerful. So essentially, it's building decentralized systems that are food-based, us growing through a network of uh, farms. Our first farm will be on Nitro Public Housing and will be the first one of its kind nationally, uh, where we will be growing thousands of pounds of food and building a pipeline for those green jobs and also have that, having that educational component with the idea of centering where the needs are, as opposed to this trickle-down idea of food that it'll eventually get, get to us. But it hasn't, it, ha it hasn't gotten to us for generations, even though we have the largest um, uh, Hunts Point market, uh, the largest produce market in the world a, within our space here in the South Bronx, it still bypasses us. And so it's, it's waking up to that reality that it's, no one's going to do that for us. We have to engage ourselves and decentralize and now regain our power. Um, and essentially that is the way forward. And that is Afrofuturism when it comes to food is reclaiming it and using it as a tool for transformation, as we earlier said.